Goat Days by Benjamin. Chapter 10. I was still waiting outside the tent, crying. My own Arbab came towards me, patted my back and said something to console me. Although it did not console me, it mitigated my wailing. He went back into the tent, opened a packet and gave me something that looked like a chapati. Kubis, I heard him saying clearly. This, then, is Kubis. I had heard this word in the riverside bragging of many Gulf returnees. Kubis. The Arbab signaled to me that I should eat. I had not even brushed my teeth in the morning, nor followed any of my morning rituals. I hadn't taken a bath. Had it been at home, I wouldn't even drink coffee without first ducking into the river, even when it rained. But that day, for the first time, I violated all my hygiene rules. I had drunk milk without brushing my teeth. Hunger for one and a half days forced me to ignore my habits. I sat outside the tent and greedily ate the new dish called kubis, even though I had nothing to dip it in or to smear it with. I didn't feel the need for it either. It had the warmth and sweetness of freshly baked bread. Every time I took a bite, my mind kept repeating kubis. Kubis. After devouring four, the name engraved itself in my mind and in my stomach, kubis. When I had finished, the Arbab brought me a glass of water. I guzzled it down. Then he offered me another kubis. I declined. My stomach was full and I was fully satisfied. I was touched by the Arbab's affection. By then, the scary figure had returned with the goats. He drove them inside the fence. Then he came and sat in front of the tent. The Arbab gave him five or six pieces of kubis. Dipping them in water, he gulped them down, drank a jug of water, and went away without saying a word. I had observed the scary figure's face as he sat eating. I saw a life hardened by sorrow and pain. He continued with his work, ceaselessly, without a moment's rest. The Arbab went inside and brought me a thobe, the dress of the typical Saudi Arab man, a long, white, shirt-like garment, loose-fitting, long-sleeved and extending to the ankle, usually made out of cotton, and a pair of boots. I unfolded the thobe and almost vomited from its musty reek. It was unspeakably dirty. The Arbab touched my pants and shirt and said, Shiladi, Shiladi. When he repeated it many times, I understood that he was asking me to remove my clothes. I undressed and reluctantly wore that stinking garment. I removed the brand new leather shoes I had brought from home and stepped into the stinking boots. It was my initiation to the stench, the first step to becoming another scary figure. Although I could foresee my dark future, I obeyed the directions of the Arbab, so grateful was I for the kubis he had given me a while ago. Pointing at the scary figure, the Arbab said something in Arabic. I could only catch the word Masara. Guessing that Masara meant water, I dutifully took a pail and followed the scary figure. I filled the bucket with water from the tank, went inside, walked through the goats, and poured it out into a large container there. It was a cement tub, about three meters long, a meter wide and a quarter meter in height. There were about 20 to 25 sections within the fenced area housing about 50 to 100 goats each. In every section there were tubs for water, raw wheat, grass and hay. The goats could eat and drink whenever they wanted. When the tub in the first section was filled, the scary figure opened the gate of the second section and released the goats. Leaping and bounding, they surged out. As he followed them, the scary figure pointed at a tub and said something in Hindi or in Arabic. The only word I could make out was Mayin. Mayin? I wondered what it was. Water or bucket? If it was water, then what was the Masera that the Arbab had mentioned? Who knew? Whatever it was, my job was to fill those tubs with water. So I did just that. Before he came back with the goats, I had filled the tub in that section. Similarly, I filled water in the third and fourth sections. It was not easy. My back began to ache from carrying the bucket filled with water. Besides, as the noon sun blazed, the heat became oppressive and I grew thirsty. 
when he was about to take the goats out from the next section, the Arbab came out of the tent and told the scary figure something in Arabic. He concurred, nodding his head. Then the Arbab came over and handed me a long stick. I received it with both my hands. It felt as though I was going through my initiation ceremony as a shepherd. Together we herded the goats towards the wilderness. After we had walked for some distance, the Arbab clapped his hands to call me. I walked back to the tent where the Arbab placed something in my hand. I looked at it, as far as I could make out, it was a pair of binoculars. I had no clue as to why he had given it to me. Thinking that it was meant to find runaway goats, I prepared to go back with it to the desert. Shuff, shuff, the Arbab prompted me to look through it. I was curious. I was holding a pair of binoculars for the first time in my life. I looked through its twin lenses. Oh, how clear everything looks. I marveled. Objects that were kilometers away appeared so near, so clear. Even the marks on the goats were plainly visible. I looked all around. I was happy. Shuff, the Arbab asked. I nodded in agreement. He grabbed it from me and took it inside the tent. Then he lifted up the pillow and drew out a double-barreled gun. He walked out and aimed at the sky. A bird was flying high up. He aimed at it and fired a shot. Bingo. The bullet hit the bird and it fell. The Arbab smirked at me. I was petrified. Shuff, the Arbab repeated. I nodded. Yella, Ro, the Arbab pushed me after the goats. That moment, I realized that my life had become inescapably bound to those goats.